All right, so dear uh, posthumans, uh, I'm extremely honored and excited to have here a real interesting, intriguing, original thinker of the 21st century. We have Anders Sandberg here with us. Anders is a very well-known transhumanist. He's also a senior researcher fellow at the Future of Humanity Institute in Oxford. Uh, first of all, Anders, thank you so much for being with us and for discussing transhumanism and far futures with us. Well, thank you so much for having me. <laughs> So welcome. So a little introduction, although he doesn't need one, but Anders Sandberg is a senior research fellow at the Future of Humanity Institute in, uh, at the University of Oxford in England. Mm? His research centers of, on management of low probability, high impact risks, estimating the capability of future technologies the ethics of human enhancement, and very long-range futures. Now, this is exactly what we're going to do uh, with uh, uh, and Anders. We're going to have two interviews because, of course, the conversation with Anders uh, uh, 20 minutes will be not, not enough to really go through the long implication of millions of years in the future. So what we're going to do, we're going to have two interviews. The first one, uh, we're going to talk about, uh, let's say, emerging technologies, uh, present and close future, and transhumanism. Again, Anders has been a, a very a leading voice in the field for many years now within the transhumanist philosophy. And then we're going to go with a second interview in which we are going to talk about far futures. And again, there are not many thinkers who really engage with it with the thought and with the possible implications of our future be because it's uh, definitely a, a, a real challenge, but Anders does. <laughs> <laughs> so first of all, again, thank you so much, uh, Anders, uh, for being here. And I should also mention that we are at Princeton at the wonderful conference Envision. Oh, yeah. Envision is awesome. It's awesome. So, Anders, can you tell us a little more, how did you get interested in transhumanism? Again, you've been a leading voice in this field for many years. Uh, and how is maybe the field changing? And um, what is your approach about the transhumanist philosophy? So, it all began with me growing up in a fairly boring suburb of Stockholm in Sweden in the 1970s. And I read all the science fiction books at the local library as a form of escapism. And then I decided, well, actually, I could make this real, perhaps. So I read all the science books at the local library, and then at the branch library, and then I started hanging out at the, the municipal library, and then the university library, and eventually I ended up in Oxford. So for me, the idea that the world could be radically different from what it currently is has always been a present uh, concept. And I realized that, yeah, science and technology are, of course, things that are most obvious, at least to me, ways that it could radically change things. So that brought me into transhumanism. I read um, Ed Regis, The Great Mambo Chicken and the Transhuman Condition, which is a brilliant overview of uh, transhumanism in the late 80s, um, as well as Barrow and Tipler's Anthropic Cosmological Principle that got me into this interest of a very large scale far future. And then in the early 90s, I entered the world of internet when I reached the university. And I joined the Extropians mailing list, and suddenly I was surrounded by people like me. People who were very interested in thinking about these things, many of them uh, far older and uh, more experienced. And uh, then we were discussing and bickering and dis uh, developing these ideas. Gradually, I realized that maybe we should start a Swedish transhumanist association. I got involved in setting up the World Transhumanist Association and uh, uh, Think Tank uh, trying to kind of demonstrate that you could even commercially make use of these ideas. And then after I got my PhD about computational neuroscience, in parallel I've been thinking about ways of improving brains and improving stuff. So then I got in at the Future Humanity Institute in Oxford, but in the earliest project there about the social and, and ethical implications of cognitive enhancement. And of course, Oxford being Oxford, I decided, okay, I'm not never leaving here. <laughs> so I stayed around at the Future Humanity Institute, which is still led by Nick Bostrom, who I think is the, the mayor and transhumanist philosopher. And we have been uh, looking at future-oriented questions ever since. Uh, Anders, thank you so much for giving us an insight about uh, the, 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 the path that brought you to transhumanist philosophy. I wanted to ask you a question connected to what you just said. How do you improve a brain? Well, that is, of course, what the philosopher in me immediately says, wait a minute, what do I mean by improve? Mm -hmm. And the neuroscientist immediately will say, oh, there are so many bottlenecks. So if we think about our everyday life, uh, the standard thing to complain about is memory. And there are ways, of course, of improving your memory by learning memory arts and the memorization techniques, which are astonishingly powerful for certain forms of information. 
but you can also change the brain plasticity. So there are various forms of medication typically developed to treat Alzheimer's that in healthy people also seem to be improving the ability for the brain to acquire new information. You can also make the brain more plastic by using electrical and magnetic stimulation in the right spots. Uh, and this has again been demonstrated to improve the ability to learn or retrieve information if you do it right. If you do it wrong, it might actually impair it. Now, the problem is memory is a relatively small thing, actually. These days we have pens and papers, we have uh, books. The, the Renaissance scholars would have envied our ability to record information without having to memorize it. So today we would say, oh, we really want to improve intelligence, which is a much taller order because intelligence is the ability to solve new problems that you've never seen before in general environment. That is having all the parts of the mind working together and that is typically much more complicated. It's not like you can fix that with a simple drug. On the other hand, sometimes you do have a bottleneck like working memory. So if you train your working memory or find an, a cognitive enhancer drug that helps your working memory, your effective intelligence goes up. But so could it do just because you took a motivation enhancer that gave you more energy, so now you want to solve the problem. The problem is, of course, that improvement is a complex thing. One needs to understand what am I trying to do and what are my strengths and weaknesses? That requires a quite a lot of introspection and sometimes cognitive neuroscience. So often when I talk about these things, students want to hear how to, they should be improving their minds and they're all hoping that there's a pill like in the movie Limitless. You just take it and become a super genius. Unfortunately, there isn't anything like that. Even if something like that had existed with those side effects, it's still too simplistic because what we want to do is very different uh, in different situations. Having focused attention is brilliant for writing academic essays, but dangerous out in traffic. We want to be flexible about it, and for that we need the general understanding. What are we trying to achieve? What are we trying to uh, be? Fantastic. And uh, so which kind of technologies are we talking about? Is that nanotechnology? Is that uh, mind uploading? What kind of technology are we could be useful to achieve this? So, in general, right now, our ways of interacting with the brain are very crude and primitive. So, we certainly have drugs, but they affect a lot of parts of the brain uh, of a, and, uh, in a very indiscriminate manner. Uh, there are ways of targeting better, and in the future, we might have ways of making microcapsules that go to a particular part of the brain and we release them with a magnetic field. We're getting better at, better at the brain stimulation and various other tricks. But the dream is, of course, to have this high-fidelity method of interfacing with the brain. Many people are hoping that we get neural interfaces that allow us to receive and send signals directly to computers. This is going to take a while because it's not easy at all to develop something that works in the body. The body is a horrible environment. The people building oil platforms for the North Sea have an easier time because the North Sea is not actively trying to sabotage them, but the immune system is actively trying to get rid of anything for them. So, Advances in just surface technologies that makes implants just uh, remain better in the body might be just as important as insights in neuroscience about where we want to put it. But long term, neural interfaces, perhaps aided by nanotechnology that allow us to do it in a gentler way, uh, and of course genetic engineering in the form of gene therapy to either make neurons light sensitive so you can use optogenetics uh, to communicate with them, or uh, modify them in other ways. That's going to be very powerful. In the really long run, I'm interested in what I call brain emulation. That is sometimes called uploading. Although uploading seems to imply that the mind is already software and it's just something that you can move around. That's making some pretty deep philosophical assumptions which might be unwarranted. But the best way of testing it would be to scan a brain, make a replica in the computer, simulate the same causal activity and see, does it actually behave like the original brain? And if you upload a philosopher like Searle, who is very skeptical about this, and Sim Searle responds, oh dear, I feel conscious, I need to write a paper. We have learned something. Yeah, that's, uh, that's really interesting. So yeah, of course, there are many questions that I want to ask you. Well, the first one is something that I think a lot of people would like to ask you, so I'm going to maybe address that first. What are the ethical implications of all of, all of this, specifically thinking, for instance, the risk of digital control. I mean, this is something that is already happening in, in, in technology that are outside of ourselves. Now, if we have an implant in our brain, what about, for instance, hacking? What about, again, uh, technologies of control? How mm. do you feel about that? Uh, so I do think they are a serious issue. Uh, and to some degree, 
it might not matter because we're already carrying around smartphones, which are more powerful uh, tools of control uh, than you can imagine. But still, there is something very unnerving about having a part of you even though it's a technological part, maybe not working for you, but for somebody or something else. So for example, there are deep brain stimulators. They work just like a pacemaker, they send signals, but the wire goes to your brain. Many of them have wireless connections, but no encryption, no password, no logging. Uh, and it's possible to hack them. Now, depending on where in the brain they're located, the effect might be everything from just removing the therapeutic benefit to our operant conditioning. If it's in a particular part of the brain, in principle, somebody could stimulate in a kind of a positive emotion every time the victim saw him and a negative emotion every time the victim saw his competitor, subtly, without the victim noticing, manipulating the behavior. And this is very destructive because if you start suspecting that maybe somebody is manipulating me and I can't even tell, that's very bad for your autonomy. Um, so it's pretty obvious that first of all we need to have good security in these implants. That's kind of obvious. It's technically slightly challenging, uh, but it's something that can be solved. It's a technical problem. The more subtle part is when we start extending our minds uh, outwards, Part of our minds are going to be residing on systems that are not exactly under our control. I'm a believer in Chalmers and Clark's extended mind hypothesis. I do regard a fair bit of my virtual possessions as part of my mind. But I discovered to my horror, shock and surprise and also glee uh, when I was in China a few years ago and Wikipedia was censored that, oh, I seem to be treating Wikipedia as part of my memory. Mm. I was looking up things without knowing it on Wikipedia all the time. Mm. And Memories that I believed I had were actually edited together by editors on Wikipedia and was in some sense a collective distributed memory that it was possible for a government to censor. Uh, unauthorized people could edit it. And um, I was up until that point not aware of it. So the problem here is when we extend ourselves, in some senses we might have to accept that other parts of our minds are not under our control. In some sense, that's normal. We don't control our subconscious very well. Uh, people who try to control the subconscious find that it bites back in complicated ways. And maybe as we extend ourselves out in the world, we might find that we actually get our technological subconscious that's not always on our side. But it also feels like, mm, just like we might want sometimes to have therapy to function better as full beings, we might need some technological therapy to ensure our integrity as uh, technosocial beings. Thank you so much. And in this uh, uh, really, you know, deep uh, reflection, um, how is the cell? Do you still uh, think that the notion of subjectivity and identity and the self is useful when, for instance, we're thinking of the self as maybe connected to different bodies or multiple bodies? Eh? For instance, thinking of the work on Natasha Vita Moore. How do you think of again notion like subjectivity, identity, the self are still useful, or we need to reframe them and think about them? So I'm skeptical of the notion of a self. Uh, I, I used to have the, the philosopher Derek Parfit as my landlord. And uh, he's famous, of course, for his book uh, Reasons and Persons with all these thought experiments demonstrating that personal identity might be more of a psychological model than a real thing. On the other hand, that psychological model is a model of something. I have memories of my childhood. I can see that I have plans that stretch over years and even decades of my life. Uh, and I think it's useful to have that kind of thing, even though the I thinking that is changing. Mm. So uh, Anders in 10 or 20 years is going to be a, a rather different being. But I still do have some influence over what uh, I develop into. And since I have certain values, and I think these values should be around, I might want to ensure that things go well for these future Anders. Even though I'm hoping that's going to be a highly upgraded Anders, even to the point that eventually, of course, Anders 2.0 and 3.0 are beyond my current horizon. I can't really imagine that, uh, what they are, or even recognize them maybe even as beings. But as long as the transitions are all done with a kind of full informed consent and awareness, I think that can be done well. The problem is, of course, there are many unknowns here, and we don't really have a good language for thinking about modifying oneself, thinking about oneself as a project. 
and handling the subtleties about subjective experience. Uh, does it matter that I'm conscious? I do think that uh, you can have moral patients that are not conscious. Uh, I actually think that you could have unconscious robots that are still morally valuable, which makes me slightly unusual. But certainly being conscious means that pain feels something. Pain is bad in a, in a much more clear sense than a robot responding, ouch, whenever it runs into a wall without actually doing anything. So the subjective experience might actually be important also to find ways of refining and controlling. Now, I'm very lucky. I have a very positive subjective experience. I'm very cheerful, probably because of genetic reasons, but also because I've done do-it-yourself co cognitive behavior therapy on myself. So that's great. And I think it's a nice thing to have good experience in the future, regardless of who or what they're attached to. But still, I think we are just at the start of thinking well about these things, because Typically, the words and terminology we have is all based on a very traditional Western idea about an atomic self, which is totally transparent to introspection and uh, has this uh, atomic soul that is a perfect identifier and eternal. The idea that we're biological, complicated creatures that are modifying ourselves both directly and indirectly and accidentally, we still don't have a good language for it. Very, very interesting. So, of course, uh, there is uh, much more to talk about with you about the future, and we are going to go there with a mm. the second interview. But before we do that, there is one more question I'd like to ask you about the present and the mm. close future, near future. So, you're a supporter of, uh, for instance, the, the science of cryonics, mm. and I want to ask you, uh, in, in the, with the notion of connecting the, to the notion of subjectivity, and a question that I have, um, and I think again we're doing speculative mm. philosophy, but what, what do you think is the condition of someone who is being cryonized before they are, if it's going to ever happen, resuscitated? Like, is that stage is like a dream state or is it like a coma state? Is there any consciousness in this, you know, stage that may mm. last 100 years, maybe 200 years or maybe 1,000 years? So where is the consciousness of a patient who is cryonized at Alcor right now, mm. for instance? So... I don't believe uh, cryonics patients actually are conscious, mm. except that I have this problem that I don't understand what consciousness mm -hmm. is. And on some days, uh, I'm just believing in panpsychism. I think everything is conscious, including the sofa. Mm. It's just that uh, beings like us who can talk and think and introspect do much more about the consciousness. So in some sense, if panpsychism is true, yeah, even a cryonics patient is in some sense conscious, except that it's probably a single state, since nothing is actually occurring. There is no change over time, if we're doing cryonics right, of course. But we can't know. But I would be very shocked, I would be really surprised, and I think this would be a revolution actually in philosophy and science, if we managed to tow out a cryonics patient and uh, he or she responded, at last, it's been so boring. <laughs> yeah, and... Um Again, if we can talk about mm. it, I see that you have, uh, mm. you know, like mm. uh, the, the cryo, the, um, that's from Alcor, is it right? It's, yes, uh, yeah. If you want to talk a little more about mm. it, um, mm. so you are planning to be cryonized eventually. Mm. And uh, first of all, what is your take about it? And when do you hope to be coming back mm. to which era, for instance? Mm. Also, should, it, should you be able to choose your, the era mm. in which you want to come back? Um, so again, what is your take on cryonics? Again, you're a supporter mm. of that. Um, how do you feel about the mm. stage in between? Uh, if you tell us a little yeah. more about your insight. Yeah. So uh, I'm wearing my cryonics tag openly. I kind of like to say I'm out of a freezer. Uh, I, most, I know a fair number of people who signed up for cryonics, but they're wearing it under the shirt just for uh, medical people to find if they end up at the hospital because they don't want to be too weird. Mm. On the other hand, the reason I'm wearing it is not just that it's nice transhumanist bling. It's also a very good conversation starter to start thinking about the future and our relationship to it. In many ways, this is a bit like a super secular San Christopher medallion. Uh, it's talking about a faith in the future. It's bringing up so many interesting assumptions in my interlocutors. But generally, I think cryonics is just a practically smart thing to do. I think there is enough probability, let's say maybe 5%, and I value my life enough uh, that I, I'm willing to pay the money to do that. But I'd rather get to the future by not dying. I'd rather have people working on life extension coming up with a good way of uh, keeping my body healthy and uh, young indefinitely. Being frozen is dangerous. 
there is quite a lot of risk that uh, it's not going to you know, work at all. There is a fair bit of risk that the suspension process causes irreversible damage. And even if you can uh, revive somebody, it might not be me. As I said earlier, I'm not too keen on personal identity being uh, super essential. So if there is a happy person in the future that borrowed some of my traits, that might be good enough. But I do think it's a rational choice to do, and I find it interesting to bring up. Of course, most people say, yeah, but what about your social context? What about your family? And I'm, of course, hoping to find my family in the future, because hopefully cryonics or life extension has worked well enough and they have availed themselves to it. But sometimes I really compare cryonics patients as refugees. We have spatial refugees today who need to flee from one environment to another one because they can't survive in the original uh, the situation. Cryonics patients today are temporary refugees. They cannot su survive in the present. So they're throwing themselves at the mercy of the future and hoping that they can get revived. It might or might not work. The future might or might not be a nice place. But it still seems to be a rational choice to do. And uh, many people find it rational to be a refugee, including in time. So where do I want to end up? I personally want to be frozen as short as possible because I want to participate. I don't want to be sleeping in. I want to be a part of humanity and its struggle to actually get its act together. Uh, although I have this uh, humorous nightmare scenario waking up somewhere uh, and there are smiling post-humans are standing around my hospital bed, which might be virtual, I might be uploaded, but, or it might be real, and they say, so Dr. Sandberg, we saved some of your PowerPoints. You made some ill-advised pre predictions <laughs> about the future. Let's see how they turned out. And I'm just going to sm smugly smile and say, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm totally embarrassed, but I would be alive. That's wonderful. Well, I think it's the perfect way to go actually into our second interview about the far future where yeah. May say, uh, Anders is going to find himself after yes. being cryonized. Yes. So again, thank you so much. All the posthumans, we have Anders Sandberg, again, one of the leading voices in the transhumanist movement. He's a senior research fellow at the Future of Humanity Institute in Oxford, so you can definitely easily find Anders uh, on, on, the, on, the, on the internet. And... Uh, our first topic was transhumanism and um, emerging technologies, present and close future. Now we're going to go into the far future with Enders. Thank you so much, Enders. Thank you.